here. Here we are in February 2023, and we are still going. Um, just to give you a quick, I think it went backwards, a quick intro to what we're going to cover tonight. We're going to talk a little tiny bit about HGR1, a little update on, on that. We're going to talk about the GOP lawsuit that's at the Supreme Court of the United States. We have a guest map maker who's going to walk us through some um, kind of amazing maps that he made, legislative maps. Um, we're going to talk about kind of next steps and what's up with Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor. And we're going to do a little update on the householder um, trial. So I'm actually going to um, start folks out uh, talking about HJR1. So HJR6, you guys probably remember, we came together in December and we went to the state house and we pushed back against the effort to make it harder to pass um, a constitutional amendment in Ohio. They wanted to raise the threshold from for passing the bill from 50% to 60%, which would mean that 40% of voters would get to quash um, whatever the majority of voters actually wanted. And we had a very, very impressive turnout. Um, you can see these pictures from the state house there. We all voted against HJR 6. Um, it was quite the, the, the setup there. Um, and we actually managed to prevent that from passing in December. And we also managed to push back, you know, this year and prevent it from getting on the ballot in May, because even though it died in December, there are, were still some legislators who wanted it to continue, wanted to bring it forward again in the new General Assembly, the 135th General Assembly as HJR1. So even though it hasn't, um, it isn't um, on, it hasn't been passed. We know that it's, there's a likelihood that they're gonna try to put it on the November ballot. So there's nothing active happening right now, but at the same time, we are still pushing back against it because you know we suspect that they are still um, pushing for it. It was reintroduced um, uh, by the same people who brought it up in December um, by um, Derek Marin and not only that, but it got worse. Um, so the, some critical things were changed from how it was in December in HJR 6. HJR 1 is worse in that it requires 5% um, of the vote for governor to be uh, collected in signatures in all 88 counties, which is really, really bad. It's hard enough when it's 44 counties. It's practically impossible if it's 88 counties, and it still has that 60% threshold. So we are still pushing back against this idea. Um, if it does get on the ballot, we will be fighting hard for a no vote. And we, we think we will succeed because this idea is unfair, undemocratic, unpopular, and completely unnecessary. So when you get these slides later, you can take a look at some of the language, some of the messaging around pushing back on HJR1. So that's just a little update on that. Um, and now I wanted to turn to um, Colin Marazzi from um, the ACLU, who's going to tell us a bit about the lawsuit that some members of the um, Ohio uh, GOP brought um, in relation to our congressional map up to the Supreme Court. So, Colin. Well, thank you, Mia, and hello, everybody. Um, pleasure to be back with everybody here. It feels like a while since we've gotten together. I hope... Uh, Everybody had a pleasant holiday and new year. Um, so I want to just briefly give a update on uh, where the congressional redistricting case uh, stands in front of um, the Supreme Court uh, of the United States. Um, as a bit of a refresher, um, some of you may uh, remember that uh, after the Supreme Court of Ohio struck down the second congressional map, um, as an unconstitutional gerrymander, there was an extended delay where nothing happened, um, despite calls for uh, a new round of map making, public hearings, etc. There was nothing happening um, during the summer and fall months. It wasn't until uh, October that uh, then House Speaker Bob Cup issued a open letter saying that 
They were exploring um, appealing the Ohio Supreme Court's order to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and sure enough, on October 14th, 2022, um, Senate President Matt Huffman, as well as other um, Republican legislative leaders, did file uh, what's called a certiorari petition uh, to the Supreme Court, essentially asking them to hear uh, their appeal from the uh Ohio Supreme Court. And basically they're asking the court to answer two questions, both of which I think everybody here is familiar with in terms of applying the uh, independent state legislature theory, quasi theory um, uh, here in Ohio. And those questions are, what role do state courts have in uh, constraining or reviewing um, congressional uh, elections, or at least the state legislature's power to regulate congressional elections? And do state courts have the ability to craft extra constitutional rules for state legislatures to follow when drawing maps? Um, that brief was filed on October 14th. Uh, the League of Women Voters and the ACLU, as well as the Neiman pe uh, Petitioners, which is the group that's being represented by um, the National uh, Re uh, Democratic Redistricting uh, Group, uh, filed our reply briefs on December 19th. Um, in which uh, we said <laughs> essentially no, but I'll get to our arguments on the next slide, but we issued our reply brief and the Supreme Court took those arguments under an advisement and scheduled it for what's called, uh, it's distributed for conference. So essentially what that is at the SCOTUS level is when all the justices gather around, they do it once, twice a month, they gather around and decide if they are going to grant uh, an appeal to a specific case or if they're going to just um you know kind of shoo it away not answer or if they're going to uh affirm a lower court's decision to not hear it um interestingly enough the original conference where this lawsuit was supposed to be heard was scheduled on january 20th and the supreme court uh punted they didn't uh issue any sort of um, decision. They didn't say that they were going to hear it. They didn't say that they're not going to hear it. They just kind of were mum on the word. So um, there's not really much we can glean from that. Oftentimes the, these things happen. Um, but we do know that the next conference uh, is scheduled for February 17th um, in a little bit over a week. So that's the day that we're watching uh, for the Supreme Court to decide to either hear the case or not. Um, Next slide, please. <clears throat> but to the arguments being put forward by uh, both parties, um, again, <laughs> I don't think there's many surprises here for this group since we are um, have been following this so closely. But essentially, the uh, Huffman arguments are that the Ohio Supreme Court, well, I thought they, I think this is pretty comical, actually, they um, created a magical a, a magically created judicial judicially enforceable standard um, based out of the article 19 language which is as we know the constitutional provision over uh, overseeing congressional map making they argued that unduly favoring one party or another or prohibiting partisan splits in counties is not a judicially enforceable standard and uh, thus um, should not be able to used as criteria for evaluating congressional maps. Um, and then they make this secondary argument that through the uh, declaring maps as unconstitutional, the Ohio Supreme Court is unlawfully robing itself in the mantle of the legislature, seemingly being what they call the invisible hand um, drawing these districts. Um, again, I, I think these are pretty, you know, uh, tried arguments uh, for those that followed along the redistricting commission in the General Assembly during our debates. Um, our rebuttal was very simple. Um, and, and I guess I should preface this by saying that we're asking the Supreme Court to roll this case into the Moore v. Harper case. I, I apologize, I didn't mention that before. But that's what we're essentially, what uh, the uh, Matt Huffman and the other parties are, are asking the court to do. Our rebuttal is that this case is totally separate and totally distinct from the questions posed in Moore v. Harper for the critically important reason that Article 19 
Yes, it was passed by a ballot initiative. Yes, we as Ohioans supported it at 75%. But the language itself was created and passed by the legislature. So the legislature itself delegated the authority and the responsibility to the Ohio Supreme Court to review such maps. And they were explicit in that. Um, so that would seem to nullify any claim that the Supreme Court of Ohio overstepped its boundaries, even if you were to read the elections clause as posing a, uh, you know, as giving the legislature sole authority to create congressional maps. The legislature created this structure, so it's kind of bound by it in, in a sense. Um, also, separate from the North Carolina case, Moore v. Harper, the Ohio Supreme Court never drew its own map, unlike in North Carolina. They only, uh, you know, iso uh, found uh, incidents of unconstitutionality and then uh, ordered it invalid and had the legislature go back or the commission go back to redraw. Um, and also the Ohio Supreme Court in its rulings explicitly preserved the map drawing power of the legislature to that effect. So there are very obvious uh, rebuttals in place to the assertions made by um, the petitioners in this case. Um, again, I, in my opinion, after reading these briefings, it seems as if this argument being put forward by uh, the petitioners, uh, President Huffman and others, um, that it doesn't seem uh, <laughs> outside of 2020 or outside of the Donald Trump Supreme Court, I wouldn't think that this case would really be able to stand on its own. However, we are coming to terms with this new Supreme Court that seemingly um, is, is a much more unpredictable. So this is what the questions are posed in front of the Supreme Court. We're waiting for February 17th, hopefully not afterwards, but it may be after February 17th, but we're looking for that date for when the court will decide to hear it or not. But <laughs> another but, um, we have a new uh, wrinkle in this line of, of of legal questions. And that is coming from North Carolina itself. I don't know if folks have seen, you may have, um, but uh, the now Republican controlled North Carolina Supreme Court in a what's been called astonishing move um, has agreed to rehear the underlying case um, that is what has now become Moore v. Harper. They, are, uh, they have agreed to uh, hear from the state, North Carolina state legislature um, and defendants to retry this case less than a year after already deciding this. What does this mean for us? Well, this means that if the North Carolina uh, Supreme Court, once they take up this case, that could uh, lead the U.S. Supreme Court to kind of kick the can down the road and not hear Moore v. Harper, not issue an opinion on it since the underlying controversy is seemingly being re reheard at the lower court level. Um, it's very early to see how this is going to play out, but just know um, that uh, this is something we'll be paying attention to. This does have direct impact um, on uh, whether or not the Supreme Court will hear more v. Harper, and through that, the direct next steps um, of what are in store here in Ohio. Um, so there is a uh, NPR article linked uh, here if you'd like to read more about it. Um, but that is where we stand um, in terms of the SCOTUS hearing. Uh, circle your calendars for February 17th. Um, that will be our, our next uh, decision day um, in this case. So um, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I'm very excited to see this next portion. Um, big fan of Ohio politics guru, his content yeah. on Twitter, his maps. They are really fantastic. So very excited to hear um, him speak next. Thank you so much, Colin. So just when we thought things couldn't get more complicated, um, <laughs> we have more and more layers. Um, and the whole concept, you know, I, I think Andrea has posed that question in the in the chat there. So what's stopping from Huffman from doing the same thing, asking the Ohio Supreme Court to hear these cases again? I, you know, uh, these trends that you thought, things that you thought were completely outlandish and would never happen, then just, you know, become the norm as, as things change. So fingers crossed that that does not you know, happen here, but um, anything is possible, I, I, I would say. I would just say, looking at the chat, um, that 
you know, this group of incredibly well-educated people on this topic are on to Matt Huffman. <laughs> they know that he was the one who wrote those provisions in the first place and then challenges them and brings them up to the um, Supreme Court. So um, any other things in the chat, Catherine, that you want to? Yeah, it sounded like Michael. Do you want to actually explain your question? Because I wasn't sure I understood. I think it was what, what Colin answered. But it was also um, if the North Carolina case is sidelined, would the Ohio case then step up and be litigated at the Supreme Court of the U.S.? Michael, it, it very well could. And I also should add also, um, even if or even when the North Carolina Supreme Court rehears the underlying case, SCOTUS very well may still issue their opinion. Um, you know, I, I, it is an off year election. This is a very contentious issue dealing with congressional elections. Um, you know, so they may think right now is a good time to issue this opinion. So there's more time leading up to the next congressional election to kind of sift through the aftermath of whatever potential decision happens. So not saying that they are going to dismiss, um, they very well could still issue uh, this this ruling in, in Moore v. Harper, but um, it's just something to pay attention to and, and good question. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. Um, so as you guys know, as um, uh, Colin referred to, we are going to be, you know, these maps that were the legislative maps, the Ohio House and Senate maps were struck down by the court. We need to draw new maps. Huffman has said that they would work on it, you know, this year sometime. So this whole process is going to start again. And, and we still want to have good maps. So I'm going to turn it over to Trevor, who's going to introduce our next speaker and say a little bit more about, um, you know, why we invited um, Andrew here and, and what is happening with maps. All right, I'm going to uh, try and be quick uh, so we can get to Andrew because he's really got some interesting maps. <clears throat> but, you know, there are just not enough words to express our gratitude and appreciation for all of you throughout last year's map making process, the whole uh, fun time. I want to give a special shout out to all my community map makers that took uh, the time to uh, train with me uh, to learn the different map making software and then um, participate in community map making sessions throughout Ohio. Uh, you know, it really means a lot. Yeah, I know it may not seem like it, but it really matters. Your work, your maps, they really matter. You know, we use them in the creation of our fair districts model map. Uh, many folks use community maps uh, in their written and spoken testimony uh, to redistricting commissions. Um, and they were, they were uh, reviewed and considered by many of the map makers who participated in our uh, community map making, uh, or, or I'm sorry, our uh, map making contest, uh, which we will be doing again uh, this year. So, uh, you know, I, I, I do want to encourage everyone who made and submitted maps last year uh, to do so again this year, uh, because it truly makes a difference. And if you or want to get involved now, or or if Andrew convinces you to uh, uh, get involved um, after his presentation, then please contact me, uh, reach out to Fair Districts Ohio. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce Andrew Green. Um, Andrew uh, was is originally from the Youngstown area. Uh, he received his uh, master's in uh, mechanical engineering uh, from Case Western in 2021. Uh, he now works in the Akron area as an engineer. Uh, he participated in, uh, last year um, in this process. He submitted maps uh, and, uh, and written testimony to the Redistrict Commission. They were really good. Uh, you know, I, I hadn't really reviewed them un until recently when I saw these new ones up on Twitter. Uh, these new ones uh, he he submitted uh, put up there a couple weeks ago, and then and they've they've evolved since I first saw them. Um, uh, with you know input that he's taken from from the community and people on Twitter, uh, and so you know check them out on, on Twitter. There's his Twitter handle in there. Um, but the, these are some of the best maps that I, I've I've seen. You know I've seen a lot of maps, uh, but as far as like 
keeping communities together and and partisan bias and like efficiency gap like those kind of like metrics and 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 and, and um bias uh metrics that that you know that really that i look for uh and proportionality are just really off the charts and um you know with that uh uh, and, and also, you know, on Twitter, like he's given some of the best explanations about the limitations and, and complications and, and requirements uh, and, and drawing uh, fair uh, and constitutional uh, congressional and, and general assembly maps. Uh, so with that, Andrew, please uh, take it away. Thanks, Trevor. Um, we can go to the next slide. So here's the... Um the most recent house map that I've drawn. And I'll, I'll just kind of walk through here um, a little bit of the, the process. Um, the, the rules governing how you can draw um, General Assembly maps are, are quite complex. And I'm sure any of us who have, you know, followed the redistricting process over the last two years now know that. And um, really the way I've, I've kind of gotten a feel for, you know, the different ways you can do these maps is is just drawing a bunch of them. I've probably done more than I want to count, um, but you get a, a pretty good idea of, of where you can go and where you can't go in certain areas of the state um, and how uh, some things that might uh so i i think the person drawing is probably somebody who is also you know here to cause trouble so hopefully um it won't be too much of an issue we will try to um deal with it as it goes along but let's just ignore those silly little red lines for now and thank you andrew for continuing and just give me a heads up when i should go to the next slide okay um, but yeah, I, I've gotten a feel for kind of, you know, what you can do where and what you can't do and how some things that you can't do forces you to do some other things. Um, and if, if we want to get into any of that, we can a little bit later on, but we can go ahead and move on to the next slide, which is the same map just has, um, zoom ins of the, the urban areas. So you can get a little bit better idea of what's going on. Um, and then we can go ahead and go to the next slide. And here's the Senate map. Um, one thing that that I'll note um, it, across, you know, the House map and the Senate map. Um, any of us who watched the redistricting process, especially with the independent map makers, Matt Huffman made a big deal about, um, well, we can't put two incumbents in the same district, or you can't put. Uh, um, it, it, Last year, it would have been um, an odd numbered Senate incumbent in an even numbered Senate district because they're supposed to run for reelection this year, but now they can't. Um, so I was very deliberate to make sure that um, no incumbent is in a district with another incumbent um, and uh, that on the Senate side, everyone in an even district stayed in an even district, everyone in an odd district stayed in an odd district. Um, I should note, not not all incumbents, uh, it, it was non-term limited incumbents. I didn't look at those who um, will be term limited out come the 2024 election. Um, so we can go ahead and move on to the next slide, which again is just some, some zoom ins of the, the urban areas. And that should say Senate map, not house map, but um, so we can go ahead and move on. So um, there are, are a number of different ways that I've tried to do this. And, um, you know, we, we heard a lot and, and, you know, spoke a lot and gave testimony about the, the proportionality um, requirements in the Ohio Constitution for General Assembly maps. And um, through drawing a, a number of different maps, I have found that there are um, 16 uh, different places that you can draw uh, a, a Democratic-leaning Senate district in Ohio. 
um, following all the other rules. I mean, you could get more than that if you go splitting everything apart. Um, so depending on where you decide to draw things, you might have to do things differently elsewhere. So, you know, if you needed to get three democratic leaning um, Senate districts, this would be the way to do it um, in Northwest Ohio, um, which is the map that we ended up with. Um, again, two and 13 in the map that we got were barely democratic leaning, but that that's uh, where we ended up. So just uh, if we go to the next slide, this gives us some, um, another configuration. Um, the, the map we saw at the beginning had district two being the democratic leaning rather than 13. This switches them out, really switches Sandusky and then some um, parts of Lucas County as well. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. So Northeast Ohio is um, one of the, the real problematic areas of the state when you're drawing uh, a map because there are some pretty strict limitations on how you can draw Mahoning, Trumbull, Portage, um, Summit and Cuyahoga counties, and that kind of landlocks you into the corner. Um, and the numbers work out in such a way that there's two general ways you can do it. One, the way um, we saw at the beginning, and then this other way. Um, and if you do it this way, as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, you can get out of um, Cuyahoga and Summit counties, you can get a total of five Democratic leaning Senate or yeah, Senate districts. Um, whereas if you do the other pairing, you can get six. Um, so if you do it this way, you basically force yourself into if if you're going to get the the fifteen that um, the proportionality requires, um, you have to do the um, the configuration with a Lorraine County and then a second Toledo Democratic District that we saw before. Um, and we can go ahead and move on. Sorry, sometimes it That's jumps. Okay. Um, and then uh, some, an alternative configuration in Southwest Ohio. Um, so the, the map we saw originally uh, had um, basically, districts 29, 44, and 80 paired together in a Senate district, whereas this um, the, has the, the House district that goes out of um, Hamilton County in a Senate district is District 30, which is more alike to the, the pairing that we saw in the, the maps we voted with this year. Um, I know there was a lot of pushback um, when the uh, Democratic commissioners tried to to do a Western Hamilton County up through Butler County and up along the Indiana border district. Um, it's you can get a lot of uh, similar results either way. Um, personally, I prefer the the former that that we saw at the beginning, um, mostly because you're able to keep um, Cincinnati much more whole in the Senate map. Whereas this one we see, it splits Cincinnati pretty good between eight and nine. Whereas uh, the map we saw at the beginning, almost the entirety of Cincinnati is all in district, um, I believe nine. I forget exactly how the numbering works out there, but I think it was nine. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. And you guys will be able to go back and look at these maps, you know, when we send you the slides as well, so. <clears throat> um, so here's a look at compactness using two um, common uh, compactness measures that I'm sure we've all heard of, the REOC and the Palsby Popper scores. Um, so in the chart at the top, um, the coloring is such that um, the best scores are green, the worst scores are red. Um, and then I plotted them on a graph um, against each other. So the top, right corner is you know generally higher scores better scores the bottom left corner is generally worse scores um, less compact districts so we can see that among you know the four different maps that were passed as well as um, the the independent map makers as well as the maps um, 
proposed by the Democratic commissioners, as well as the um, expert in the uh, litigation at the Ohio Supreme Court. Um, my proposal is up towards the top on, on the House side um, as far as compactness is concerned. Um, and then we can go to the next slide and talk about the Senate compactness. Um, kind of a similar story. The four maps that we saw were the least compact pretty clearly. Um, uh, the four maps that were approved were among the least compact that we saw. Um, and mine, mine is up at the top half there again. Um, and then we can move on to the next slide. Um, so here is a similar kind of chart. Um, it's not compactness this time. We're looking at two different uh, measures of partisan bias, the efficiency gap and the mean median. Um, averaged over six, um, the, the mean median difference, which is, um, so the efficiency gap is the, um, the ratio of quote unquote wasted votes um, of one party to the other. And then the mean median difference is the difference of the mean, median districts margin of victory compared to the statewide margin. So um, if the, the 50th most democratic house district, for example, was won by 10%, we'll say, and the statewide race was won by 8%, then it's two points, 2% uh, off would be the mean median in that scenario. So um, averaged over six elections between 2016 and 2020, this is what we see. Um, so kind of the opposite on the graph at the bottom um, to what we saw back in the, the previous slides, um, the bottom left corner is lower efficiency gap, lower mean median, which is good, less biased, whereas the top right is, um, you know, more biased. Um, and again, we see that the four maps that were approved by the commission are the four worst maps that we saw um, as far as both of these metrics are concerned. So we can go to the next slide, which will show the same thing for the, um, the Senate map. Um, again, the, the four um, maps that were approved are among the worst. Um, and the other four that, that we're looking at um, do significantly better. Um, and then we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So um, here is the, the, the partisan, partisan breakdown of all the districts. Um, on the, the house map, my house map, that is, or, or all the different house maps, I'm sorry. Um, based on the uh, average of the six statewide elections that I've been talking about. Um, and this kind of shows us how, you know, the court took a lot of issue with um, the asymmetry of the, the ultra competitive districts right around 50%, um, especially because the, the index that the commission used was slightly different, similar, used the same elections as well as a couple others. Um, and the way they averaged it was a little bit different. So they got slightly different numbers, but um, I believe all of the districts from map one, two, three, four, as well as the Sykes-Russo map um, in the 50 to 51% GOP range were all counted as democratic districts. So you know, in map um, three and map five, for example, we had, we saw 19 uh, house districts between 50 and 52% democratic. Um, whereas in my map, whereas on the, the GOP side, we didn't see any. Um, whereas in my map, we're, we're seeing a much smaller number of democratic districts that are ultra competitive in that, that range, as well as there is a um, Republican leaning district in that range to, to kind of balance out the, the asymmetry that we saw. Um, and then we can go ahead on to the next slide, which is the same thing for the Senate map. Um, again, a similar story. Um, 
the asymmetry right around 50% is is not as um, pronounced as it as it was with the the four maps. Well, really the the last three maps. The first map wasn't asymmetric about 50%. It was just not even close to proportional. So um, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. I think that's the end. The others oh, are. Is it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, but so I. So if there's, if we have time, I could take a couple questions if there are any. I haven't been watching the chat, but. Um. Well, I don't see any specific questions in the chat, but I really, I'm sure people do have questions. So feel free to drop something in the chat or raise your hand if you have a question. Jeff Wise says, did you have any concerns with the OCRC map? The Ohio uh, City Country Districting Commission. It's been so long since I've looked at it, so I, I would have to circle back and look at it. And I, I just wanted to say that, you know, we really applaud Andrew for this work and it is really important. And, and as Trevor said, everyone else who is map making and we invited Andrew here to kind of, you know, model that citizen map makers can make some fabulous maps, but of course they all need some, you know, input and community input. So if you have questions or suggestions, if there are things about how districts or communities were divided that you want to bring up with Andrew, um, we encourage you to, um, you know, let us know and we'll, um, and we'll, uh, forward those to him or you know if if you think of it later in the evening and you want to um, ask a question you're more than welcome but i think um you know a lot of work went into this and and it is an iterative process it sounds like andrew you learned a lot as you were going on absolutely um it, it goes back to you know when we first started drawing the maps you know a year and a half ago or whatever it was now um and you, you just get a feel for kind of um, what you can do and what you can't do in, in particular areas. But I saw a couple questions. Michael yeah. asked what map tool I used. Uh, primarily it was Dave's redistricting. Um, I did uh, map incumbents into QGIS, QGIS, um, and exported the shape file from Dave's into QGIS to, to make sure I was um, keeping incumbents in different districts. Um, as far as Jeff's question to comply with municipal, municipality boundaries, um, primarily use Dave's as well there, um, but I did do a, a check at the end once everything was done. Um, and there were a couple splits because Dave's isn't perfectly accurate on all the municipal boundaries. Um, so what I did was um, I got the, uh, shape file from the census, um, converted that over to a block assignment file and uh, matched up the blocks in districts to um, the blocks in municipalities and used Excel to sort through um, what which municipalities were in more than one district, basically. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna put my clap sign up. Um, we really appreciate it. Julia, when do you think Andrew's maps might be able to present for approval? Will there be any hearings? You know, these are, we hope and assume there will be hearings. These are kind of unknowables right now. Um, and we will kind of give you, I mean, we want there to be hearings. We want this process to start quickly so that there can be meaningful public participation and you know what a struggle that was last time and we will be fighting that battle again this time. Um, I'm sure that that you know Huffman et al will want to push it off as late as possible to limit the amount of public you know meaningful public participation but we will do our best to um, make sure that there is some and and you all will as well I feel sure. Um, so Andrew, thank you so much. I think we're going to go on. We still have a couple of things to cover, but again, we'll be sending these slides and we hope everyone enjoys um, looking at these and we'll be, you know, there'll be links as well. So um, John Carlino, I am not any, as soon as you unmute, 
I'm going to boot you out of here. All right. Sorry. I got my slides went forward. Okay. Catherine. Wrong? Oh, hello? Yeah. I, John, I, can you mute yourself? Other. There we go. Thank you. So one of the things I was going to say is that we know these, uh, these kinds of maps improve with some input. Uh, so community mappers, I'm going to encourage you to let us know what you think um, and to let Andrew know what you think. I, I think it's exciting to, to get back to the actual map making and think about how we can do it differently this year. Um, you know, what we do know is that the state and house maps are like that process is likely to begin following the budget. So you're talking, you know, summer, you know, summer, early fall. Um, so it'll be a little while before we get started on our 2024 maps. Now, um, I know that all of you, and for that matter, me, uh, we're all we're all just chomping at the bit. We want to get, you know, collecting signatures. We want to get out there. And I thought it was worth kind of going through like, well, what's going on right now? And what are the kinds of challenges that make it so that it takes a while to get things started when it comes to a citizen initiative? Now, what I would like to highlight is it's a little bit like a movie. So if you think of it this way, we want to get to the part where we film the movie right now. But what we really need to do is we need a real strong plan. We need money so that we cannot just get on the ballot. And, and many of you will remember in 2017, kind of just how incredibly hard it was to get si signatures and manning Petition Central, you know, with volunteers and just all of the challenges. So, you know, we want to go into this with adequate resources. So if you're like, what are they doing behind the scenes? You can imagine. Now, there are challenges about language. And I'm going to actually ask Mia, can you throw in the poll? Yep. Okay, so um, this is going to be a poll for you to answer. Now, one of the things that we really struggle with is who's actually going to vet um, the folks that are actually going to go on this Citizens Redistricting Commission. We need somebody to look at applications, figure out whether or not there's violations. For example, let's say we have a rule that says no lobbyists. Somebody has to look and be sure that this person is not a lobbyist and they don't have a family member as a lobbyist. An entity has to look and say, hey, um, we want to be sure that there's a pool of 42 and then from those we pick, but you have to narrow that down. There are, you know, thousands of people often apply to these things. And so it's worth thinking about, well, who should actually do this? And you'll notice we included the Legislative Service Commission. They help the lawmakers write the bills. We included law school deans as possible folks. In California, the folks that do this, um, it's the auditor. They have an independent auditor. We had an auditor who sat on the Ohio Redistricting Commission. So that doesn't work as well. So I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. Top two, Mia, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to just say, Pick two, folks. Look at the look at the list on the poll and pick two. The two people you think would be the most, you know, uh, independent, nonpartisan, uh, trustworthy, um, et cetera. And and so um, we'll give it a little time. But before that, so what are the other kinds of things that we need to do to get ready? We need as many folks on the same page about the language, about how we're going to do the campaign, about you know what this should look like. Uh, and so it actually takes time to do that kind of coalition building. Sometimes we're talking about things like, well, who's going to be responsible for what part of the campaign? And so that's another thing to think about. The other thing is um, Morvi Harper, and the US Supreme Court, we need to understand what the decision actually is. I know it could be moot, but it's also likely that it won't be. And so then we need to understand what we're going into and so that we create really good language that does not, shall we say, violate constitutional muster. And so those are the kind of challenges we're at. Mia, you're ready to end the poll? Absolutely. We've had All right, everybody your last chance on the poll. 
71% participation, not bad. 70. All right, everybody. Come on, I'm one or two more people so we can get to 75. There we go, we ended the poll. Okay, so um, I will share the results quickly. Um, you can see that state librarians and map making professionals are very trusted. Law school deans, not so much chancellors at state universities. <laughs> um, but you know, this is the kind of thing that we that that it's really useful to to feed, to suss out. You know what people really think. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, is that all right, Catherine? Just move Sounds ahead. Like plan. So, um, sorry. Oh, there we go. So, you know, Catherine talked about some of the things that we need to get ready before we would start. We want to start when we know we're fully ready, but we can get some things, we can be working on some things while we're getting those other things ready. For example, um, we can, we plan to reboot the Speakers Bureau. We had a really excellent Speakers Bureau going on in 2021, 2022, 2020, 2021. It's all the years are running together. Um, so we will be rebooting that and um, getting you guys to sign on. Um, we need to educate the public and do research. We need to do social media um, outreach. We need to get public input on these kinds of things like the poll that we just did. We need to increase our footprint. I mean, you guys are so amazing um, and, and we absolutely love our fair districts advocates, but we need to reach out to new groups and let them know about, you know, the failed process and that we can do, um, you know, we can do this a better way. Um, and we also need to raise some money. So I'm going to uh, ask Sherry Rose to talk a little bit about that. Well, good evening, everyone. I know that it's never anyone's favorite topic um, to talk about fundraising. And however, I, I liken fundraising and I, li I liken the development efforts for um, any campaign um, and most certainly the fair districts as the gas that runs the, the engine. Um, so we are a well-oiled machine. Um, and when it comes to gathering signatures and when it comes to getting out there, it is a beautiful machine. Yet without gas, it doesn't really go very far. So when we think about the fundraising efforts, we are looking at things like um, advertising. We're looking at educational material. We're looking at yard signs, t-shirts, the rallies that we all love and Mia is so good at organizing, those are not free. <laughs> they, um, we have the free t-shirts that everyone is, is so welcome to have when we get there, but they're not free. Um, and so what we, the printing that we have and certainly the staff time to get all of those ready and that's just the beginning. So when we're looking at some of these in, in the future and going forward is just kind of planting this seed that sometimes it doesn't necessarily require you to do the ask because not everybody is really um, comfortable, right, with that ask. But maybe um, if those that have ever been to or heard about a house party, that is where you get your closest friends together and that maybe we have one of those um, where Mia was talking about the Speakers Bureau, is we invite one of those speakers um, to come to a house party at your, at your house, and we will do all of the preparations. Uh, we'll bring the food, we'll, uh, we'll help you arrange all of that, and then we'll do the ask, um, and then asking your friends and family. Uh, we've had people do Facebook fundraisers before. Um, those birthday fundraisers, for those of you that are on social media, will see that people ask for money for their birthday in, in lieu of presents. Um, so there are many ways that we can do it in a very um, passive way in our, in our efforts. So we're just kind of planting that seed right now because we know that um, ballot initiatives, for those of you that may not know, um, could top anywhere from 30 to 50 million dollars. <laughs> so, um, and every dollar when it comes to our campaign counts. 
So we thank all of you that have donated already to uh, Fair Districts, and uh, we look forward to working with you in the next uh, months. So if you're thinking about a house party, especially in the summertime when it's so nice to be outside um, in Ohio, is those are things that we can start talking about now. So um, I will drop my information in the chat. So if anyone um, is thinking about that, and you'll hear more from us in the months ahead. So thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, we appreciate that. And we really do try to, you know, I think we're pretty, um, we have, we need your support, but we try not to hammer it. So we know that when we we ask and we really need help, you guys are going to step up for us. And we, we really appreciate that. Um, so um, I saw a couple of questions in the chat that related to like, what does Michigan do and what does California do? And we had, for anyone who's, who wasn't able to make it, we had two really great huddles that were with a California commissioner where Catherine was interviewing her and with a Michigan commissioner and he came and presented slides. And we'll make sure to um, share um, those recordings and of those sessions again, when we do our follow-up, because those are really useful. And I assure you that we are looking into all of those, you know, we are in touch with all of the experts who know about what is done in all of those other states. We've, we've also had a, we also ha had a huddle where Professor Niven came and talked about, you know, what do they do in Colorado? What do they do in California? And we can share those slides with you as well that, that kind of went through that. So we are, you know, we're looking into all of these things. Um, I'm just going to, um, you know, we're almost at time now. And so, uh, I, there were some questions about um, the Chief Justice, and I think Catherine was going to say a few words about that. So, you know, I told you a little bit about like thinking about this like a movie. So one of the things that's very clear is that there, there are coalitions like ours where we're, you know, we're like, okay, we went through this process. There were changes in the Ohio Constitution. Um, clearly elected officials chose not to abide by the Ohio Constitution. You know, these folks are drunk on power. Uh, what do you do with drunks? You take away their keys. That means we need to think about doing an independent commission. And clearly, you know, we're moving rather slowly and we're kind of doing this thoughtfully. One of the things that's really wonderful is that Maureen O'Connor said, you know, during, you know, as she was coming, you know, towards her retirement, that she planned to work on an independent citizens commission. And she reaffirmed that, um, and this is from February 1st when she um, had a, a, basically an interview where she talked about kind of her life and what she was thinking about following retirement on February 1st. Now, what I, I, I wanna highlight to everyone that um, it would be really exciting and will be really exciting to work with all sorts of different people when we go back and we think about you know our, like for some of us that collected signatures for example in 1981 and 2005 and 2012 and 2017 we've had an opportunity really to learn from that and you know it's exciting to think about going forward with folks who uh are uh as you know prominent as um the chief justice and, you know, then for some others of us, we think, you know, the chief justice never exactly held them accountable. So there are lots of questions that we might have for her. I'd like to invite her to join us um, sometime on a huddle. So I just want to let you know that I'm going to extend that invitation and that we are all in a process. You know, I think there are all these cars that are all moving towards an independent commission. We just need to get a bus and get on it. All of us get on it at the same time. There we and go. With that any questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, we're all going to get on that bus, folks. Uh, don't don't you worry. We're all going to get on the bus. But you know, we're just figuring it all out right now. Um, and with that, I'm going to move on because you know I pride myself on being uh, timely with these meetings. 
the Common Cause folks on this call just wanted to let you know uh, about some of the work we've been doing relating to the householder trial. I hope you don't mind if we just share this information. Um, Catherine is, you know, the preeminent expert on all the dark money shenanigans that go on with, um, you know, went on with House Bill 6 and the way that we can, the things that we need to do in order to prevent this from happening again. So we created a whole website. The website has has a timeline, it has FAQs, it has resources. We did a, Trevor um, did a history of the scandal that we released on Groundhog Day. We have a petition, um, you know, that uh, asking our legislators to come out in favor of the exact reforms that we need to prevent this from happening again. We also are doing updates. Um, we have Sandy Tice is um, attending the trial and is um, sending us updates. They're kind of nitty gritty, you know, uh, from, the, from the actual place where it's happening. And you can sign up for these trial updates and then we will be sending them to you, um, you know, uh, uh, periodically. So um, we really, appreciate you jumping in there, signing up for those trial updates, looking at the website. We're going to send all these links out to you, of course. Um, and then, of course, we always, our next huddle is March 8th at 6 p.m. We have some links um, and including a link to donate and to our timeline. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, we appreciate all your um, do not report poor Colin. It's thought Colin was the perpetrator. Um, <laughs> um, we appreciate all your questions. Are there questions in the chat, Catherine, that we need to answer right now? I I don't think so. The one thing I would say is, you know, send an email. Um, why don't why don't we? I'm going to put my my email right into the chat. So, you know, if you have suggestions, if you have questions, we don't necessarily have to wait a whole month. Um, please touch base. The one thing I would say, you know, about the householder trial is it's well worth like really coming to grips with all of the different ways that, you know, the Speaker of the House basically abused our trust, you know, and, and essentially sold the state house. And it's worth taking a little bit of time to think about, well, what are the kinds of reforms that would make a difference so this just doesn't happen all over again? You know, many of us can think back to 2005 and CoinGate. Well, you know, we really need to create greater transparency so that we don't just keep having, you know, scandal after scandal. So I, I, I highly encourage you to um, sign up for those uh, updates because a little, it's a picture of what happened, but also, hey, what are some reforms that would make a difference because it's not just Householder and Borges that are on trial. It's it's literally, you know, the state, the way that we have set up the system, the system is on trial. And with Absolutely. that, thank you everybody for coming. We and, and we appreciate it. We'll be doing new links every single time and hopefully we will not have another Zoom bomb. You all were real troopers to get through that together. and. A big thank you to everyone. I did want to say thank you again to Andrew. Uh, we really appreciate your joining us today, um, giving us some inspiration. Yeah. And the Lotus people are clapping. Um, thanks for really, having really me. Really appreciate it. Yes. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. We'll send you. We'll send you out our follow up. All right. Be well, everyone. Take good care. <laughs>